Welcome everybody. So I'm Anthony Allen. I'm the ecological communication specialist here at Save the Sound. And I am here just to introduce Bill and the amazing work that Bill does uh, and some of which he'll be taking you through today. Today's webinar is part of our, our ongoing series is on protecting forage fish through management and policy. And this is something that Bill is has done a lot of work over a lot of years on, uh, not only in Long Island Sound, but elsewhere. And we feel really, really lucky to have him in Long Island Sound as our sound keeper. Uh, so Bill is working tirelessly even now out on the boat and uh, in, in other channels that are available to us at this time um, to make sure that forage fish populations are protected and that we all are aware of their importance. So without further ado, Bill Lucy, our sound keeper, take it away. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, this is a big topic and we're gonna try and cram it into 25 minutes here. So uh, I'm gonna talk fairly fast and I guess what I'm, I'm actually doing is taking collective wisdom from a lot of other people that are working on this topic and trying to condense it. Um, so, as Anthony mentioned, I work for Save the Sound, um, and we're a regional environmental organization. We work in New York and Connecticut in the watersheds that drain in the Long Island Sound. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to go into the uh, first slide here. So, I guess the first thing we need to, to determine is what are forage fish. Many of you probably know. I have the official NOAA definition uh, in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, small schooling fish that other things eat, basically. It's important to note that most fish are forage fish at some point in their lives. Some are forage fish for their entire lives, like these herring species over on the left. Um, but striped bass, when they're small and young bluefish and they're schooled up, they're also forage for, for larger uh, animals. Um, the herring, we, ha we have a pretty good diversity of herring here. There's a couple of uh, river herring, alewife and blueback on this slide, three species of shad. We have the Atlantic herring, which is saltwater, and also the Manhattan not pictured here, which is also a, a major forage fish for our ecosystem. And I included at the beginning of this program a picture of the endangered roseate tern. Uh, this is a picture, uh, I, I'm not quite sure where this one came from, but I was talking to a caretaker out on, I believe on Little Gull Island, and he's been out there working for 30 years setting up the research projects out there. And he told me in a phone conversation that a few years ago, the sand lance didn't show up. That's another very important high oil content forage fish. And when they didn't show up, the, the breeding pairs of terns didn't have high enough quality food to feed their young. So they had a year where there was no nesting success because this little forage fish right here was gone. So I just put that out there as an illustration of how intricately woven forage fish are to the ecosystem around us. Uh, one main characteristic is they are inherently difficult to manage. Uh, a lot of these species aren't fished commercially, so we don't know how many there are. Um, the only way to get data on those are fishery independent surveys, so not catch data, but scientists going out doing trawls and seines, or in this case, John, our uh, Save the Sound fish biologist, manning a trap there, physically counting all the alewives going through a fish passage project that his team constructed. Um, there's, there's cameras, uh, there's uh, other, other methods for keeping an eye on how the fish are doing at certain locations. Uh, the other issue is that different species have different life histories. So managing for Atlantic herring, uh, which go to specific areas to spawn, uh, they are more traditionally managed in a J curve, they call it, say, than uh, Manhattan, which can spawn in the water column in different areas multiple times. You're never quite sure where they're gonna be. Um, and then within species, there was some isotope work done on juvenile, on, on Manhattan harvest. And what happens is when the fish is small, the chemistry in the water will get incorporated into its bones. 
And so when they go somewhere else and get captured, you can take that apart and say, hey, this fish came from the Gulf of Maine, or this fish was born in Long Island Sound in general regions or Chesapeake Bay. And the production in Manhattan from a paper a couple of years ago has Manhattan production shifting north. So about a third of the Manhattan now came out of the southern New England area. Um, and another big thing which I love to remind people of when the fish are here one year and they're gone, it's not necessarily something that humans have directly done. There is natural fluctuation in environmental conditions. So I've got this graph down here, which shows what's called the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. Basically, you got warm, wet winters, cold, dry winters, and they alternate through 30, 40 years, a few decades. And during these changes here, when it goes from warm to cold or cold to warm, you can have big impacts on uh, recruitment success, or basically when the fish spawn, their young don't make it or the older fish can't find the right food because the ocean conditions had changed and they don't have good survival. So there's an example of a paper that says we should manage these fish with these downturns in, in mind. So if you know there's a big change coming through modeling, you wanna throttle back your fishing so when the crash happens, it's, the valley's not so steep. And I have a personal experience with this in Alaska with Pacific herring. There was, uh, in 1977, there was a good population of herring. The state decided to open up the first fishery ever. They had a 15 ton quota. One boat came in, caught 40 tons. And it was the same year as a regime shift, the 1977 regime shift that completely altered the Gulf of Alaska. So those fish were over harvested at a time when there was great flux in the national environment and it took 30 years for that population to rebound. So we have to be very careful in our management. Um, and of course, you need to know what you're dealing with. These are historical um, range maps of the alewife, blueback, herring. There used to be fish running all up and down this, these ranges and most of these rivers. Uh, Kurt Johnson, our president, talks about remembering people smoking smelt Long Island Sound when he was a kid and talking to old timers that remember when smelt or forage fish were, they run black in the rivers. And that's what this uh, picture at the bottom is. A friend of mine sent me this from last, last year from uh, Haines, Alaska. You could go in Southeast Alaska, you could go down to the river during the smelt runs with a net and a five gallon bucket and fill that bucket up in 10 minutes. I imagine Long Island Sound used to be that productive. So you need that we're going to try and get back to that productivity, but we need to know what we have. So we have biologists and citizen scientists looking uh, for these fish. Um, Vicki O'Neill, um, she's, she's got a group of volunteers that we work with down at Westchester. And this year they've actually found an alewife in the Hutchinson River. If anyone knows that river, it's heavily polluted. It was at the base of a dam that's slated to be removed. And so there's a remnant run there. We'll probably have to seed it to really restore that run. So Vicki does a lot of work for on the New York side. Also, SeaTuck uh, is an organization over there that has a big citizen group monitoring all kinds of the runs. So we know the status. And in Connecticut, we have uh, Steve Gephard who puts out this incredible weekly fish summary which has all the counts from the fish passages and cameras and all kinds of appropriate links to um, what's going on with the fish runs this year. Um, where I come in a lot is I'm a lobbyist and I lobby for fish legislation. This, this is forage fish legislation, HR 2236, the Forage Fish Conservation Act. It's a bipartisan bill that would amend the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which is the the driving force behind fishery management in the U.S. been very successful at rebuilding and preserving fisheries. Uh, they have eight regional councils scattered around the United States that make decisions. And what this act would do with, for the fish that don't have management plans, herring, Atlantic herring and, and Manhattan do have plans, but some that don't say the river herring that maybe have state closures, but not a management plan, um, they would be tasked with creating a uh, plan just like any other fish. And Senator Blumenthal has been a big champion of that. Um, one note that came out in Steve's uh, summary is that NRDC last week filed a petition in court uh, against NIMS. 
They've been trying to get the river herring uh, listed as endangered for a number of years now, and NIMS came out saying that's not, we're not going to have that finding. Uh, they countered and said, you're not taking into account climate change, and it's going back to court. It's what this graph is, the dark blue line is river herring commercial landings. You can see they've been depressed since 1980, and they have not rebounded. The American Shad's doing a little bit better. You can see this valley here, that was probably part of a, a climate shift and then they rebuilt. Um, so why we wanna do this, there's a picture of a humpback whale, a friend of mine fishing game took during herring surveys in Alaska. And some of these whales, most of the uh, humpback whale distinct populations are no longer listed because they have a lot of forage around them. So that's, we keep that in mind, the birds and the whales are part of this. Um, the best way to get there, in my opinion, is ecosystem-based fisheries management. And what that is, is a new way of managing the ocean eco ecosystems. So at the top, you have the ecosystem, which includes the fisheries and energy, tourism, conservation, aqu aquaculture, all the stakeholders, all the users, yes. wild and not, that are in a particular management area. Then you drop down to uh, a fisheries ecosystem plan, which you have multiple fish, fish, how do they interact with each other, the climate, the habitat, and predator species. And then farther down, uh, there's one fish, but you do look at that fish species and how to manage it within the context of climate, habitat, and predators. And at the bottom, it's just single stock management. That's usually what we do. That's the traditional fisheries management. We have a hundred striped bass, uh, we can catch 20, that leaves 80 to breed to make 100 for next year. Um, those do work, uh, but I believe that taking into account all these variables to the best of our ability is the more resilient way to do it. Um, so I'm going to focus in on one example of this, Manhattan Amendment 8. And they're directed to uh, find an ecological reference point. That's a fishing rate for the industry to harvest Manhattan that provides food, Manhattan, for other species. And what they did is they ran some models, looked at diet studies, and they figured out that spiny dogfish, striped bass, bluefish, wheatfish, um, and herring for other reasons all correlate with uh, Manhattan abundance. So they looked at those fish within the context of how to set a catch rate. Now don't get too concerned about this giant table of numbers. I'm gonna just speak about this column. So right now, they're looking at 0.19 rates. So basically fishing the biomass of, of uh, Manhattan at a rate of 0.19, so a fifth. Uh, their single species approved rate is 0.31, so it's much more conservative. But during this process, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission knew they were going to develop these ERPs. They knew they were going to be lower. So they took this target and said, we're not going to do it at maximum sustained yield, fish everything we can. We're going to do it at 80% of that because we know we're going to drop it. So it actually last year, I think the industry fished at about 0.17, 0.16. So they were well within the guidelines here. And this is a peer reviewed process. The, the scientists who've done this, worked on it for 10 years, feel fairly confident. Um, these are just scenarios. So if all the species I mentioned, bluefish, striped bass, dogfish, wheatfish are all healthy, they're all at their right level of biomass to be sustainable, you could fish Manhattan back up around at this rate. Now, if they're all at their threshold, meaning they're all needing to be rebuilt, they're all becoming deep depleted, they're all at the stage where they're about to be overfished, and we do have that situation with striped bass, potentially herring, uh, bluefish, you cut way down to 0.03. So that's your fishing rate, almost down to nothing. And what that is saying is we got to leave these fish in the ocean for all these other stocks to feed on and grow. Um, and the herring, they want to, they say that the herring correlates as well. And so if, if there's a lot of herring, you don't need as many Manhattan because these, these species will prey switch. Now a striped bass in Maine might be eating a lot of herring, but maybe mostly Manhattan down in Chesapeake Bay. So one problem with this model, is it doesn't have any geographic context, but that's why we need to get started, figure out the bugs and move on. Um, 
another big part of our forward fish management is protecting their spawning and their migration. Now this is a slide indicating Atlantic herring management. Now, Atlantic herring are managed by the New England Fishery Management Council. And in 2018, they created a control rule which said, you know, things are starting to look bad. We're gonna cut back on fishing. And what that did was reduce the quota to the industry substantially last year. Um, they also created a 12 mile buffer zone, which was enacted in November of 2019. So the big industrial trawlers can't come in here and fish. And the reason why both of these things are important is that in this little red circle here, that's where a lot of talking with Steve Gephardt, who's kind of our forage fish, anatomist fish guru in the state. This is where a lot of these fish uh, stage in late winter before running up Long Island Sound rivers. And that was also, if you looked at the effort data, a lot of trawling was going on in here. So a lot of our fish were getting caught out in the, in the Atlantic herring fishery before they could make it into the sound. So this is where our organization focuses. Uh, Gwen McDonald leaves our dam removal restoration, ecological restoration program. Um, and that's what we do on land in the watershed for these river run fish. Uh, the first thing you want to do, though, is don't mess up something that's not broken. Don't fix it if it's not broke. If there's a good section of river, don't dam it. Don't put an underside culvert on it. Uh, if there's a good riparian area, don't build on top of it. Don't fill wetlands. Don't develop in the estuaries. And even out at sea, going back to the sandlands, you want to protect those under undersea sand spawning areas, even as far out as Stillwagon Bank, there's some talk about mining sand. So they'd have to do some research to make sure that if they extract sand from these spawning areas, they're not going to negatively impact the productivity of Iowa, I mean, uh, sand lands. So we reopen a lot of lost habitat. We just had a, a fish pathway uh, reopening yesterday, I believe, day before. The last couple of days, we opened one up. Um, and this is an older one we opened up, Brides Brook. And uh, I just read Steve's fish summary from this week, came out today, 409 alewives passed this restored area that they weren't really accessing before. That's a real fish run. That's a fully functional fish run in Long Island Sound now. That'll bring in ospreys and eagles and everything else. The other thing we have to really keep in mind on shore is stormwater. We have a lot of impaired waters in Connecticut, and most of that impairment is caused by rain hitting our roofs, our roadways, pulling asphalt bits off the roof, or brake dust and tire oil drippings off the roads. That goes into storm drains or streams. And the problem with that is larval fish, they, uh, when their eggs are very small, are very susceptible to heavy metals and all kinds of contaminants that will impede their growth, cause mutations, even kill them. Uh, the other thing by managing stormwater through green infrastructure, cisterns, bioswales, wetlands, all the different techniques to grab that water and slowly soak it into the ground, it cleans the water, but it also mitigates peak flows. And what happens is when you have a lot of roadway, asphalt, concrete, the rain hits that, shoots off very fast, you get these very flashy, they call it systems, that can blow out fish nests, it can throw uh, spawners back downstream over dams where they had just gone through their, the fish passage burning a lot of uh, uh, energy. So this is a lot of the stuff that we focus on. This is a dam at, a removal at Hyde Park and this year our fish biologist caught a, the first shad that's been recorded there. So there's a potential new run building there. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm very, very uh, privileged to be part of this. And I'm gonna finish with one last story. Um, that I just learned about um, from, we have another uh, Elena Cologne who works in our Mamaroneck office. She did, uh, uh, she used to work with uh, freshwater mussel restoration down in the Delaware watershed. Now freshwater mussels are fantastic filter feeders. So as some of the storm water or extra nutrients from fertilizers or farms is coming down, these mussels can process that. So the water entering the sound becomes cleaner. The way they propagate is they move around on fish because mussels can't walk. So what they do is they spray their what's called glochidia on the fish. It gets caught in their fins and their gills. And some of these species like the alewife floater, which we have in Connecticut, specifically targets blueback herring, shad, and alewife. 
So they need those fish in order to go upstream, reseed the bank, the, the, the stream bed, and create a robust population to the size where it's actually filtering enough to have an effect. So if you can think of the 5,000 dams, give or take, that we have in Connecticut, how many of these runs were extirpated and can't get up to where they were? What did that do to the muscle? So I just leave you with that story because once you start breaking up the environment, there's all kinds of other effects that you may not foresee. Um, and with that, I will switch to questions. I know that was really fast. I covered a lot of ground, um, but open to any questions people may have. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, that was really fast and a lot of information. Um, but we, we did allocate a half an hour for this conversation. So what, what we'd like to do is if folks have, have to leave at uh, 1230, please uh, post your question in chat um, so that even if we don't get to it while you're still on the call, uh, we, can, we can try and cover it afterward. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the next five minutes or so uh, to do some Q and A, and then we'll close out the meeting, and then y'all are welcome to stay on uh, and and keep talking with Bill, uh, and we'll we'll keep it going. Um, but we do want to be respectful of people's time in that way. So, Bill, we we have a question come through from Garrett. Uh, what's your opinion of the Cook Company that harvests bunker? Is Save the Sound involved in protecting the bunker schools? <coughs> Um, yeah, so the Cook Company is a salmon, salmon aquaculture company out of Canada, and they bought Omega Protein, which is the number one harvester of Manhattan, and they have a fleet of boats. They're the ones that get most of the Manhattan. Um, I'm assuming they did that to vertically integrate so they could create cheaper fish meal for their, their uh, salmon aquaculture program. Um, that's why we want to switch to ecosystem-based management. We want to make sure while there's a, an extractive industry that, that, that is that intense, um, that they can still do what they have to do, but we're leaving enough fish in the water for the whales. Not only that, we're leaving enough fish in the water for the future whales, because a lot of these humpback populations are growing. The striped bass are not in good shape. We need to leave a lot of fish in the water for the striped bass. Um, so that's why ecosystem-based management needs to be um, uh, employed because it will protect from over-harvesting. Now, back in 2012, they finally set a limit. Uh, Omega Protein was harvesting whatever, um, and whatever they wanted, essentially, and a lot of that was going into fish meat. But a lot, a lot of it actually goes into fish oil. And um, I one time co correlated the shipments and the top 10 pork producing uh, states were the top 10 export states. So what they do is they take the oil when they pull pigs off of um, their mothers early, they don't get all the mother's milk. So they end up utilizing uh, fish oil to replace the mother's milk in the pork industry. So we're moving big chunks of energy around and we need to be very cautious that these birds and whales still have food. Any other questions? Yeah, we had another one come through from Greg. What do you see as the long-term trend for the sound? Is it improving? Yeah, I would say it is improving. Um, I didn't get into this, but there was a really good response this year, my understanding from Steve's reports that uh, blueback herring were showing up and uh, young ones. Uh, and that, as you saw from the graph, they're, they're really declining. Um, so maybe things are starting to turn around with all these dam removals and these fish bycatch reduction policies that have been implemented and a lot of these rain gardens and cleaning up the sewage treatment plants. Uh, I think the sound is improving. Uh, we have to be very careful that we don't go backwards. As things warm up, it's going to be harder to keep the ground that we've gained. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be doing this work if I thought it was a lost cause. I think we're, I think in my lifetime, we're going to see a lot of restored runs and more wildlife in the response. Mm. Yeah. Anyone else with burning questions? Uh, burning questions for Bill. 
have a question. Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Liz. The oyster mussel, Clochidia, I guess you mentioned. Can that survive if a fish is going up a fish ladder? Because isn't that pretty rough on the fish? Like, wouldn't they get knocked off? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, as I said, I just, I just learned about this, but my understanding, and I'll take a stab at it, I wish Elena was here, um, is a lot of them will get in the gills. Oh, okay. So I think they're a lot more protected there. And if you think about it, natural rivers have riffles also that are pretty rough. Um, so, but that's, that's, actually, that's a valid question. I, I'm not sure how that, you know, would impact them. Is it possible to see the fresh water above the dams with the... You know, the yeah, there are hatcheries that in different areas that actually take these endangered mussels and are doing are planting them. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, once things are going, you want the ecosystem to go. That's the beauty of a dam removal versus a fish passage is that once the dam's gone, there's no more maintenance. With a fish passage, you have to make sure the logs aren't getting caught in it. And if it starts getting old and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are, there are efforts actually all over the country and other countries to try. They're very rare, a lot of these. So um, there are efforts to restore them. And are there several dams lined up to be demolished? Is the funding there to keep, keep a steady <laughs> uh, project base going there? We always manage, the Nature Conservancy does a lot of dam removal. We do a lot of dam removal. The state, uh, Fish and Wildlife, NRCS, there's a lot of groups involved. Trout on Lemon will get involved sometimes um, in these dam removals. And we take them as we can, as, as the resources allow, um, we, um, we remove them. You know, we're a small organization. We try and get a couple, couple projects a year. I know the Nature Conservancy does the same. And, and the state, uh, Connecticut Deep, maintains a long list of dams. And they have a priority list of which one should go first. So if you take down this dam, it'll open up 10 miles versus if you take this dam down, it only opens up one. So the one that opens up the most habitat um, usually is targeted first. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bill. And thank you. We have more questions coming through. I, I just want to pause. It is 1231. So I want to respect that, um, that we said we'd wrap at 1230. So I'll do a little closing here and just thank Bill for this presentation. Thank you all for coming and joining us. Uh, those of you who would like to stick around and have more conversation, continue this conversation, are more than welcome to. Um, but if you do have to have to leave at this point, we just want to thank you for coming and encourage you to uh, look into this work some more. Reach out to Bill if you have questions. And please continue uh, to support this work. It's, it's incredibly important. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to do that. One way, of course, is by donating. Um, you can do that through our website. Um, but there are, there are plenty of ways to get involved with this. So um, with that, we'll go back to conversation, but I uh, wanna, wanna say farewell to those who, who have had to leave. Um, so there was a, a question that was similar to the one you just addressed, Bill, which is how do we save the sound, uh, think we can increase the number of dams being removed? What would, what would have to happen? Um, so our wish obviously would be a revolving uh, loan fund at the state level. And when I brought this up during my lobbying, typically laughed at, but you know, let's just have $10 million a year in a bonding package that we can rotate through and uh, just start increasing the speed of this. Um, there's another avenue, the Clean Water Fund right now is probably one of the most progressive programs at the, in all the country. Connecticut has a very impressive program. Um, so they can do 50% grant and 50% um, loan, low interest loan to municipalities. And right now it's focused on getting rid of the rest of the CSOs. These are combined sewer overflows where stormwater and sewage mix and there's too much volume for the plants so it gets shunted directly into the sound or into a river. Um, so the state really wants to get those cleaned up and separated over the next 20 years first. 
Um, but in the language of that um, legislation that authorized that, river restoration is allowed. It's never been used for that. But let's say there's a big infrastructure program that comes through with this COVID-19, get more people back to work. Maybe some federal money could go in there and have it tagged for, for dam removal and we can um, increase our efforts. But yeah, it's, uh, it's just a matter of resources. It's a matter of money um, and it's gonna take uh, federal assistance and state assistance. Yeah. And, you know, if we did get all that money uh, allocated for this kind of this kind of work, um, we'd 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 have to build our team and other organizations would have to get involved. And that would be that would be wonderful. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, our, our our lead engineer on this, uh, Gwen McDonald, she's really adept at seeing a project, knowing what's needed to be done, negotiating something reasonable and executing. She just not, she's just knocking these things off. Yeah. Um, so you give her more resources, resources, she'll just get more design work done and uh, more contracts issued. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Uh, next, next question uh, from Bill. Hi, Bill. Um, the last few years in the Mill River in New Haven, there have been thousands of dead bunker. Uh, I've seen this as well. What, what, what is happening there? Do you think? Well, first off, call me when that happens, because I usually, I, most people call the state, um, but call me because I go and take video of that stuff. And um, we do a lot of water quality monitoring. So we have um, a team that's in 42 bays and harbors looking at water quality, including dissolved oxygen. And that's what's happening with those fish is that when the water gets warm, it doesn't hold as much oxygen. And when you get a tidal wedge coming in, it takes that deoxygenated water and it pushes it up to the surface in a wedge. Now, if there's a bunch of bunker back in there, they're going to suffocate, especially if some striped bass or bluefish are out there. They would rather suffocate than get chomped by a predator, it seems. And they just die. I mean, we had a big one, big kill in Black Rock Harbor last year, my home port. And I had it called in to me and I went and took some, some video and... Um, that's why we're working to restore all these bays and estuaries. We're trying to clean up the sewage collection systems, septic tanks that are oozing in too much nutrients that are causing algal blooms, which suck out the oxygen when they die and respire, um, getting people to put less fertilizer down, do the stormwater runoff, switch to electric vehicles because internal combustion uh, vehicles, they exhaust SOxes and NOxes, right? NOxes is nitrogen that can deposit on the water and it's an atmospheric deposition of a nutrient. So um, we need to just make all our bays and harbors healthy again. And these are all the techniques to do it. Yeah, and, and just to point out, uh, Bill's contact information is on this slide that you're seeing right now. So uh, feel free to take that down. Um, he will, he will respond. Um, all right, next question from Angela. Are there shoreline qualities that herring require upstream? For example, trout and freshwater like shading from vegetation for cover. So what, is, what, what are the requirements for herring? Um, my understanding, and I am not uh, an expert on this, uh, I was in Alaska for 20 years, so I do know a lot about saltwater herring and river smelt and salmon. Um, but what's been explained to me is uh, the river herring like to have um, pools, big ones, and they need access to the ocean unimpeded. Why Brides Brook, they can go right through this beach dune into kind of this placid water, which is perfect alewife habitat for spawning. Um, the bluebacks do a little bit better, like trout, they can handle a little more riffly. You don't want a raging river. They need some, you know, it needs to have pools and relaxed waters for them because there's, you know, they're small fish. They're not like steelhead that'll be in a raging riffle making a, 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 a red or a fish nest. Um, but that's a big part of it um, is a combination of access, clean water, and um, some calm water mm, and that's that's uh all of those are things that when we do dam removals and fish passage projects we take all that into account we do some riparian buffer restoration work and um 
building riffles into the into the restored stream lengths. So um, we're we're thinking about all that, and we we're excited to keep doing more and more of that work. Um, so seeing no other burning questions for Bill, um, maybe this is a, a good place to wrap. I uh, want to thank everyone again for coming and joining this webinar with Save the Sound. I want to thank Bill for his time and for putting this together for all of us. And I mean all of us because I think there are, there are many of us in the organization even that, that always appreciate hearing from Bill and learning from Bill. So um, thank you, Bill. And we look forward to more of these webinars in the future and to seeing all of you at them. Uh, we're going to be doing more uh, related to fish. I know next month we have one from Gwen, actually, uh, in, at least in part, um, about dam removals and fish passage. So, so make sure you tune into that one. I think that's on June 18th, but check the website um, and sign up for that one. So thank you all for coming and I hope you stay safe, stay healthy, and join us again. Take care, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank everyone very much.